It's 1945, and the Second World War is drawing to a close. Despite this, the flow of American armor continues to stream into the European theater. Among these are a small number of the newest American weapons of war. These machines, known as the M26 Pershing, hoped to level the playing field by giving the US forces a tank equal to the Tigers and Panthers they faced. However, the emerging threat posed by the new Tiger II would bring a modification to these Pershings to match the firepower of the Long 88. This tank would become known as the T-26E4, or Super Pershing. Throughout history, there have been countless tanks, all designed to kill. But not all have been a success. What happened to the ones that never made it, and why did they fail? My name is Konovar. Join me as we journey through time, uncovering failed projects and forgotten creations in Cursed by Design. Before we get into the main topic, I want to give a special thanks to the sponsor of today's video. Clearly, if you clicked on this video, you have a thirst for knowledge, but what about your physical thirst? That's where today's sponsor, The Coldest Water, comes in. I know that when I'm playing games or working on videos like this one, I commonly either forget to drink enough or I'm too lazy to walk up and down the stairs frequently to refill my cup. The Coldest Water solves that with their bottles which range from small to absolutely massive. They also keep your water or other drink cold for up to 36 hours or longer. I tested this myself and the water was still cold after 3 days and there was still ice in it after 2. So once you finish quenching your thirst for knowledge with this video, go ahead and click on the link in the description below to get yourself one of these fantastic products and use the code CONE at checkout for 10% off. Not only will you get the coldest water, but you'll also help support the channel and this series. Now let's get into the video. When someone mentions the Super Pershing, likely the first image that pops into your head is this tank. However, although this is a Super Pershing, the field modifications it received hide what the original tank beneath was. To fully understand the concept behind this upgrade, we need to first look at the 90mm the original Pershing was armed with. The 90mm M3 was a gun capable of matching the 88 found on the first Tigers. The feared King Tiger, though, mounted a much stronger 88, which easily outmatched anything it could face. This made the need for a better cannon which could match the Long 88 paramount. This need for a gun eventually led to the 90mm T-15, or as the early production units were designated, the T-15E1. The gun proved capable against the German armor, being able to penetrate a panther's upper plate at a range of 2600 yards. Obviously, with this success came the idea to find some way to mount this gun into an armored vehicle. Eyes fell on the shiny new M26 being the most likely candidate, and so the testing began. Just days after the first Pershings were arriving in Europe, a T-15E1 cannon was mounted in the turret of the first T-26E1 prototype. Subsequent firing trials, however, revealed a problem. Due to the long 50-inch shells the cannon fired, reloading was extremely tricky and stowage of the ammo was problematic as well. To resolve this, the cannon was redesigned to use a two-piece style ammunition like that of the IS-2. With this change, the cannon was redesignated as T-15E2. Tests of this new cannon were conducted using a second prototype tank, this time a T-26E3. One of the easiest ways to spot one of these early Super Pershings are the large springs on the turret roof. Due to the increased length and weight of the gun barrel, these were necessary to allow the gun to elevate. In the early photos, you can clearly see the exposed springs before metal shielding was placed over them. Other modifications the tank received included upgrades to the elevating mechanism as well as the cradle lock for the gun. A large counterweight was also attached to the rear of the turret to account for the increased weight. With these upgrades completed, the first tank was shipped to Europe for field trials. The tank sent was the first prototype, meaning it still housed the T-15E1 with its one-piece ammunition. With its arrival in March of 1945, it received its official designation as T-26E4, as well as a production order of 1,000 vehicles. Before we talk about the limited production, however, we need to take a look at the sole example of the tank to be shipped overseas and see any combat. Upon arrival, the tank was given to the 3rd Armored Division. This being the only Super Pershing on the continent, Major Harrington, who was the chief of the tank repair service for the division, wanted to ensure that the tank was not lost in combat. To prevent this, he enlisted a lieutenant by the name of Belton Cooper, who would go on to write the famous book Death Traps after the war. To accomplish this, some extremely wacky field modifications which wouldn't look out of place in a Mad Max movie were attached to the exterior. Using whatever he could find, his team set to work adding two layers of 38mm boilerplate to the whole front. 
Despite this steel not being as strong as true armor plating, the angling and effective thickness was good enough that they theorized it would cause ricochets. The turret front on the Pershing was weak enough to be outmatched by the Tiger and Panther, let alone the Tiger II, so the upgrades to the turret were much more significant. Cutting torches at the ready, they descended on a destroyed Panther, slicing a piece of its 80mm frontal plate off and creating holes for the Pershing's main gun, coaxial machine gun, and sight before attaching it to the turret face. However, this increased armor obviously increased the weight as well. With all of this armor being placed on the front, which was already heavier due to the gun barrel, the suspension suffered severely. This caused the nose of the tank to dip downwards, meaning the elevation angles of the tank were completely thrown off. To counteract this tilt, more weight was added to the counterweight on the turret, eventually leveling off the tank to an acceptable degree. Two more pieces of steel were also welded off the sides of the stolen panther armor to shield the turret cheeks and possibly to partially act as more weight to counter the gun. All told, these modifications increased the weight by upwards of 5 tons. All this work would come to be unnecessary, however, as the tank would only see combat on two occasions. This was partly due to logistical issues that plagued it upon arrival. By mistake, the ammunition for the 90mm gun was sent to the 635th Tank Destroyer Battalion. This mistake was later discovered when the 635th found the shells were 12.5 inches too long for their guns. Not only was the ammunition misplaced, but the specialized sight given to the Super Pershing, which was calibrated to the increased velocity of the cannon, had been removed prior to leaving the United States. To remedy this, the standard M71C sight from the 90mm M3 was put in its place, although this required working out a full range sheet for the gun. The first use of this tank in combat was reportedly between Wesser and Neudheim, where it destroyed an unidentified armored target. The second use is also a very controversial one. On the 21st of April 1945, in the city of Dessau, the tank engaged in combat with what Gunner Corporal J. Irwin claimed to be a Tiger II. The enemy tank hit the Super Pershing but ricocheted off the armor. Upon returning fire, the Super Pershing punched through the lower plate of the tank, detonating its ammo rack and blowing the turret off. This supposed engagement has been scrutinized over the years, however, with quite a bit of evidence disproving the likelihood that it was a legendary King Tiger on the receiving end that day. Although it is entirely possible for the Super Pershing to destroy one had they encountered each other, the nearest German Panzer Battalion with Tiger II's was reportedly 70 miles away from the duel. This leads most to believe it was more likely something like a Panther or even Panzer IV, which was either mistaken for the bigger cat or possibly even exaggerated after the fact. Regardless, this would be the last time the tank saw combat, with it ending up in a tank dump after the war, where it was photographed before disappearing forever. This wasn't the end of the T-26 E4 program, though. Even as the Frankenstein's monster of a Pershing was being created in Europe, work was still being done on a production version of the tank. In total, 25 of these would be built instead of the original 1000 order. The only major difference between these and the second prototype vehicle would be an internal hydropneumatic equilibriator, which replaced the exterior springs. These tanks were further tested until 1947, but the issues caused by the two-part ammo eventually saw the program be shelved and most of the tanks used as range targets. The technology developed with the T26E4 would be carried on by the later M26E1, this tank used a new variant of the 90mm known as the T-54. This tank was essentially the same as the T-26E4, with the only main changes to it being a new recoil system and a 50 cal in place of the original coaxial 30 cal. To solve the reloading problems, the new gun also used a shorter, fatter round which permitted it to maintain the ballistic capabilities of the original T-15E2. Two prototypes were built and tested, and their performance was quite good, but due to budget restrictions in the years after the war, it never saw full-scale production. In the end, the T-26E4 Super Pershing could have been a very powerful weapon for the Allied forces. Like the standard Pershing, however, the war was nearly over and the much more plentiful tanks used by the Allies stole the day. The fact that even just one of these machines actually reached Europe is quite an achievement in itself since the US had largely avoided allowing field testing of any new equipment. Although extremely promising, the American King Tiger killers would never truly be used for their intended role. One solitary Super Pershing remains today, on display at the First Division Museum in Illinois. I want to take a second now to thank you all so much for voting on this topic. If you want to learn a little more about some of the nitty gritty details regarding this tank, I encourage you to check out the video the Chieftain made about it. I'll include a link down below and at the end of the video. As always, a special thanks to all my YouTube members for continuing to support the channel. If you want to continue voting in a monthly poll for future topics, click the join button and become one today. 
If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more videos just like this one. Appearing on your screen now will be one video from my channel, YouTube Feels is Best for You, as well as the full Curse by Design playlist if you don't trust an algorithm to pick for you. See you there.